bamboos with bad first layers, drooping overhangs, blobs of doom that are a little special, and exploding heads. All this and more, Print Fix Friday, episode 124. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. And if you're new here and you're struggling with your 3D prints, we are here to help. If you want, you can submit your fails to us by reaching out on all the social media platforms or emailing us directly, youtube at 3dmusketeers.com. Links, of course, down below. We want to help you getting back to printing with purpose. That's the goal of Print Fix Friday and the reason that we do it. And hey, we are looking for a sponsor for this series. If you guys have any companies you think would be a great fit, let me know. So I think it would be awesome to have kind of a title sponsor for these videos. Anyways, let's dive right into this with a bamboo with some kind of rough first layers. It's white filament, which is inexcusable, but we can still help. Is there any way to get these little gaps on the bottom of the first layer filled? Bamboo X1 Carbon Esun PLA, 220 on the nozzle, 40 on the bed. It's a little low unless they're running the bamboo cool plate. 200 millimeter second print speed, 0.2 millimeter layers, 0.5 first layer width. I know it's minor, but it sticks out to me. I've tried changing layer width and height slightly. And they're using the, they're saying monotonous, but I guess that's kind of right. Anyways, they're using monotonic infill for the first layer. I know what they're experiencing. These are fun little artifacts that can occur. Partially, we're going to look at how clean the bed is. If you're still running the bamboo cool plate, I've never personally been a fan of it. It's not my cup of tea as far as build plates are concerned. I like PEI sheets personally with the honey badger plates from Fabrico being ones that I absolutely recommend. We've had some for a while now and they just stick like a hot damn. And that's great for this kind of thing. But this is more actually perimeter overlap that you're looking for. The more perimeter overlap that you have, the better this will be. And potentially, depending on how you're slicing your files, you might also want to change it over to Arachne. Now, there's no reason that we should need Arachne here, but I believe traditionally, Arachne is not what is used in Bamboo Studio, and instead it uses the classic slicing style. I don't use Bamboo Studio anymore. We are using Orca Slicer for all of our input shaping based machines. So grain of salt that I don't even have Bamboo Studio on my machine anymore. But yeah, just up your infill overlap percentage and you'll be good to go. Also make sure that bed is clean. The 40C bed, I'm guessing it's gonna be the cool plate. If it is a high temp PEI plate, then I would try upping that to 60. But I don't know if that's particularly the problem. You can also try reducing your first layer speeds if the overlap percentage doesn't fix it. Hope it helps. Drooping overhangs above supports. Hey y'all, having some massive issues with my overhangs that are under supports. I played around with the support settings and have adjusted them so they're right up against my print and are still causing me massive issues. Has anybody dealt with this in the past? Any help would be greatly appreciated. Is it Ender 3 S1 Pro with a Sonic pad using Orca Slicer with normal supports, PLA at 215 with a pair of 5015 part cooling fans running at 50%. This is cooling. You don't have enough cooling and you've got the fans to do it. So turn them up. This is what happens when PLA is just too soft and it's too warm. It will have a tendency to warp a little bit as you're printing it if you're not adequately cooling it. As far as PLA is concerned, send it. You can give it as much cooling as you want as long as your hot end can keep up with it. And generally speaking, you'll be fine. For parts like this, you might also want to look at lowering those actual speeds for those perimeters because the faster you go, less effective your cooling is. So try upping your cooling as high as it can go. See if that helps. And if it doesn't, you're going to have to start reducing those speeds in those areas because if you're still running fast, you're not getting the cooling that you need because those fans aren't spending enough time going over that area of the park. Next up, a fail from friend of the channel, Mr. Chuck Hellebuck, otherwise known as Chep and Filament Friday here on YouTube. We'll link to him in the description if you want to go check him out. And he's been testing the Creality K1C. And initially it was a big improvement on the K1, but soon the same A-plate bed adhesion issues as the K1 Max appeared and he got 
the blob of doom and he broke the thermistor removing it it's a new design hot end so he's waiting for replacements from creality and uh that's no fun at all we can see a nice small pancake stepper motor though that is nice to see for a setup like this but those types of blobs of doom are bad like proper bad when it goes up and fully encompasses the hot end you're gonna have to end up replacing parts and now that we're moving towards ceramic heaters for hot ends it is way more complicated to do that kind of thing simply because there's more stuff involved in it you can't just pull out a heater cartridge and put in a new one and yeah, I get it. The old style cartridge thermistors and cartridge heaters that we could just easily replace were easily replaceable, but they don't provide as good of heating nor as consistent of heat as these wraparound ceramic style heaters. And often these new ones are actually PTC as well. So they're considerably safer as far as heating technology goes but it means that the thermistors are also likely relatively proprietary. And while that looks like a pretty standard connector, so if you did want to make your own, you could, be the K1C is actually not out yet and is still in testing, it wouldn't surprise me if it is something different. We would actually love to take a look at it. Creality has been asking us to take a look at the K1 or one of Creality's affiliate companies. I would like to look at the K1 Max specifically, because I think the value is a little bit better, but I am curious regarding the K1C. And while these are effectively clones of bamboo, it is a little bit different, and it seems like Creality is making a decent product again, which for a while, I had my suspicions. When you have issues like this, and you are new to this, it is always good to have spare parts. When it's a printer that you're testing, you might not be able to have those spare parts. I would be curious to know if there was some sort of filament sock on it. I can't immediately see one, but I don't want to rule it out. I would think that Creality is providing them at this point, but if there isn't one, definitely we need to add one. And if you don't have a silicone sock on your printer, definitely add it because it will help you in events of blobs. Maybe not specifically this bad, but blobs in general, it can help out a ton. Always a bummer though to see, especially when you're testing a machine and you have a failure and you have to wait for spare parts because it didn't come with spare parts. So uh, companies, including either an entire extra hot end or specifically things like extra thermistors or extra heaters, should they be replaceable? It's a very, very low cost thing to do. It has a lot of value to the end consumer and will likely reduce your support tickets by a considerable amount by just including spares in the box. Been happening since I changed my nozzle. Thermal runaway. I love that printers come with thermal runaway now. It is so nice to see that pretty much every printer out there does have thermal runaway protection and it actually works. It's good to see. We've got an Elegoo printer. I don't know if it is a Neptune 3 or a Neptune 4 or what version of it is. I don't have any of those printers. You might be able to tell by the screen, but they are printing and then it stops printing because it goes into thermal runaway. And this has happened ever since they changed the nozzle. And we can see someone says, you broke your thermistor. It needs to be replaced. Ah, probably not. If we are able to get to temperature to some extent and then when we start printing the temperature drops rapidly when the cooling fans turn on mr catlett here asked did you put the silicone sock back on after doing the nozzle and they said it was falling off but i put it on and it went away thanks glad it was a simple fix and they said hopefully i would agree this is probably a neptune 3 because the temperature's at 205 and i don't think that the neptune 4 runs that cold because it is a clipper based machine even printers with marginally decent cooling can easily cool down a hot end beyond its heating capabilities and that means that when you are going to be trying to print your temperature is going to fall your hot end is not going to be able to keep up and it's going to trigger thermal runaway thermal runaway occurs when the hot end is not raising temperature at a certain amount for a certain amount of time so if it's expecting 5c every 30 seconds if it doesn't reach 5c after 30 seconds it should trigger that thermal runaway and we can see it's at 199 and it wants to get to 205 it did not get to 205 in the amount of time that it wanted to so it says i've got a problem traditionally thermal runaway happens when your thermistor comes loose and your printer will just continue to heat and heat and heat and heat until it potentially catches fire 
This is a really dangerous thing. It's something I'd like to revisit. We tried to put a printer to Thermal Runaway and create a fire years ago. We had enough ambient air moving across it from the wind in Florida that it just, it didn't work. It cooled it down enough. But with modern day printers, it is very simple to have this go bad if Thermal Runaway doesn't exist. And in this case, it does, and it did its job. Good job, Thermal Runaway. This one comes via our Patreon Discord, which if you would like to join to the $10 tier or higher at Patreon, YouTube channel members, or PayPal, links of course are down below. And it's a lot of fun. We hang out there all the freaking time, like way more than I probably should but it's good fun and I like it. This comes from the Sobel Facebook group where an individual said they have the fast track to producing a smooth build plate. Yep, that's not good. This is what happens when your Z offset isn't set appropriately and your nozzle just decides to chew away at your build plate. Now, unfortunately, this build plate is trash. We can see that they have an auxiliary cooling fan on this. This is likely an SV06 Plus. I think I'm fairly certain it's a plus. And if they added the auxiliary cooling fan, it might be somehow impeding that bed probe. Or if the bed probe is loose, that could also create a problem. But our Z offset is not set appropriately, and that nozzle is dragging through the PEI powder coated plate. The other thing to note is that if you are running a stock nozzle, a brass nozzle, you need to replace that as well. The steel sheet is much harder than the brass, and the brass is likely going to be, at least to some extent, damaged by scraping through the PEI and the forces going down onto the machine and the plate itself. Again, spare parts are always a great thing to have. I have never had it happen this bad, but certainly when we've been looking at dialing in first layer, sometimes it's so close, you have to quickly just turn off the power to save the build plate. This is most commonly a problem with the Creality glass plates, the Carborundum, because it is just silicon carbide. It's sandpaper. And if you drag your brass nozzle across that, you're literally sanding it away. So don't do that. That's bad. Our probe looks like it should have detected the build plate. So if the machine lost its Z offset for some reason, you could redo it. But at this point, you're minimally flipping the plate at a maximum. You're just outright replacing it. We did an entire video on that Z offset and how to look at it, how to determine what is good and what is bad. And I don't think I need to tell you that this one is bad. But if you're curious about Z offset, we'll card to that video so you guys can take a look. It's a good video. I think you'll like it. Right, Victoria? Next up, a fail from Man of the Sky, who's been trying to print this relatively tall object on his Prusa Mini running Input Shaper and a Revo. I didn't realize he was running a Revo on that. That's cool. So we've got a, looks like a smooth plate. I'm pretty certain that is a smooth plate. And we have a tall object where it printed okay, and then all of a sudden it turned into a blob, and then spaghetti this is caused by when your print detaches from the build plate and actually sticks to the nozzle you can see it creates this kind of blob of doom here on the print but eventually your printer's knees will become weak its arms will become heavy and unfortunately you end up with some mom spaghetti it happens we've all been there before a brim would save this because remember if you like it then you should put a brim on it brims are cheap they will save tall prints like this and you can even integrate them into the design if you wanted, but pretty much every slicer on the market will allow you to just add a brim right there in the slicer without having to design anything in. But if you wanted to add one that was larger or thicker than a single layer inside of Prusa Slicer, which given this is a Prusa Mini, I'm going to assume we're using Prusa Slicer, you could easily just add in a flat plate that is 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6 millimeters thick and merge it with the part itself to create a thicker base layer that is wider while that will require you to do a little bit of surgery with an exacto knife or some sort of hobby knife that would absolutely be a safer bet than just risking it like we saw here this can be reduced by making sure that your printing temperatures are accurate as well but for a tall thin part like this honestly you're asking for trouble as far as I'm concerned. Last but not least, a fail from my good friend, Uncle Jesse. Let's take a watch. I just heard a pop from the other room and came in here to figure out what the heck did I just hear? 
and I just found this Magneto head on the, the floor. It's a resin 3D print that wasn't thoroughly cleaned all the way through, through the openings, or maybe, I don't even know if there was any openings on this, and maybe that's why it popped, but this has been sitting here for uh, maybe two years now. This is a case of a resin print with resin still inside of it. This was likely completely full of resin, or as Uncle Jesse here said, it wasn't properly cleaned out. This is a very common thing, and we've actually seen it before, where we saw some battle tanks that had some damage from this exact thing, where the part was just full of liquid resin and it was leaking out. Now, for a tank, that's battle damage. For uh, this one here, that's gonna require a little bit more work. That's why it's so important to add those drain holes to the bottom Bingo. of your resin 3D prints and make sure that you've got all the resin cleaned out. You absolutely want to make sure that you have drain holes. Generally speaking, we want at least two drain holes that will help allow air in and resin out. And if you can have them, have them on opposite ends of the part to allow that travel of resin. If you are curious and don't know how to do this, that is what UV tools is for. We did a video a while back about UV tools and it's probably do that we make a new one because uv tools is constantly updating honestly i feel like every time i open uv tools it's got a brand new update and while the update might not have anything that is valuable to me it is nice to see that they are continuing to work on it but it is the cheat code for resin 3d printing and will tell you if you have areas like this that will be resin traps and in this case also a suction cup where that resin is going to get stuck and it can drill the holes for you after you do your print files, you can slice them in whatever slicer that you want. By the way, I've been using Voxel Dance Tango recently. Would you guys like to see a video all about that? I, I've been enjoying it. It's not a free slicer, but it's one of the better ones we've tried when it comes to automatic supports, but there are some gripes that I have. So let me know if you want to see more about that. Let me know in those comments below. But UV tools will tell you if you have problems like this and allow you to drill the holes and in fact it will recommend where to drill the holes for you so you don't have to think about it it's what i love about uv tools and being the fact that it's totally free and open source well we gotta love that we love open source here in this industry it's odd that it takes a long time for kind of those gases to build up and the part to finally pop and this has been one of the more significant failures of this kind that we've seen in a long time it's not often that we see it this bad but it's still pretty cool either way, I think. It's just, you know, a little bit different. Has this ever happened to you guys? I've never had this problem, but I know if you buy files online that come pre-supported, you might not ever check them. I'd love to know if this has happened to you as well. And while this particular print might be a bit of a headache, the people right next to me are not. At the $5 tier and higher, you get your name in lights in our credits. And if you do want to support, links, of course, in that description down below. Right below me will be the entire Print Fix Friday series where you can see how print failures occur and more importantly, how to fix them so you can get back to printing with purpose. That's all I have for you guys today. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. And hey, like the video if you think we deserved it. Have a good one. Who's a good baby? Who's a good baby? Ooh, oh, oh, oh.